This is Art 364, Part 12, the 19th century art. Uh, we're beginning with architecture. And this first example is the uh, uh, Houses of Parliament in London. Uh, we saw it last here in the painting uh, by Turner where the original building was, was burned down. And you can see in the background there's these two towers. These, these are the towers of the Gothic Cathedral, Westminster Abbey. And uh, there they are back there. They're still there. They didn't burn. It was just the building that was in this site. Uh, it's actually not a cathedral. It's, it's an abbey. Anyway, it's a, this building is a, a, a combination of neoclassicism and romanticism. I, we talked about those in relationship to painting. But how, do they, how does that work in relationship to architecture? Well, here's the ground plan of the... Houses of Parliament. We're seeing it uh, with the, this is the riverside. So this view we were just looking at it was from from up here, looking looking that way at it. Um, notice that it's a symmetrical building. It's laid out as a, 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 an arrangement of rectangles uh, along an axis right here. There's a few things a few things that are out of the axis. There are uh, the things that didn't burn in the fire. Uh, but the the rest of the, the new building is essentially a uh, an example of Palladian architecture. That is, that is Andrea Palladio, the architect from the mid 1500s, who wrote a book called the uh, the Four Books of Architecture. Um, he he in in that uh, uh, work, there's a it has a bunch of plans like this. These are uh, houses or villas. So, so these are small really, versions of, of what the House of Parliament is. It's just a, an expanded version of this, where you have uh, a symmetrical building with essentially rectangles around it. With these represent rooms. And according to to Palladio's uh, scheme, he would have the, the ratio of the sides of the rooms being related according to some geometrical or numerical theme. Uh, but as you see, they're all they're different ways of representing uh, rectangles and 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 in in a, in a symmetrical arrangement. This one has a little dome in the middle. If you think of this, um, you know, if if you had a dome right here, this would basically be like the Capitol building in in Washington D.C. It is uh, a building. It, it's also Palladian in that in that sense. It is the, in, as far as the ground plan is concerned. It's just a bunch of rectangles around a a, a symmetrical axis. All of them you know, horizontal, vertical, uh, uh, similar. Um, but the, the, the thing is that the romantic aspect of this would be that the, the skin of the building, the outside, the, the image that you see is Gothic, or uh, what you call neo-Gothic, just as you have neoclassicism. This is bringing back something from the past, a look from the past that includes all of the Ornamentation. You look, um, these vertical spires, little things with crockets on them. Look uh, close at say the windows, for example. This is the windows. Um, these cusps and uh, niches with uh, uh, sculpture in them. Uh, all these things. They spared no expense to make it look genuinely like a Gothic building, but. As I said, on the inside, it's a neoclassical building. That is, a building that, you know, looks very much like any other neoclassical building. Uh, there are many at the time. Uh, since since Palladio uh, published his book in the 1500s, I mean, there have been many buildings like this, like uh, the Louvre and uh, Versailles, and you know, many other big public buildings that were designed based on the villas of, of Palladio, like this, but just expanded. Uh, into a much larger group of rectangles. But once you make the, the structure of the building, the bones of the building, you can put anything on the outside. And in this case, they, just, they chose to make, make it uh, look like a Gothic building, uh, basing it on a particular English Gothic called the Perpendicular Style. Now, the Gothic buildings, their ornament has a sort of a logic to it. 
you know, they, it, it grew out of Romanesque buildings. But there was, at the end of the Romanesque period, a desire among the builders of, of uh, these churches to uh, increase the size of the windows so as to have more light, because light coming in through uh, uh, the windows into the church was symbolic of, of the presence of God. And the more light you can have, the, the better. So they uh, transformed their architecture from Romanesque to Gothic, uh, changing the, the vaulting, the, the way the walls work, the way the, way the supports work, the buttresses. Um, all of these things were, were done in an effort to create more light. So there's a, a reason for all of these ornamental uh, things, like, like these sorts of things. Uh, that has to do with church architecture and, you know, the, the purposes of that. But in the Houses of Parliament, it's, it's just strictly ornament. It's just something applied on the outside to make it look, um, you know, to evoke that image of uh, the specialness of, of Gothic architecture without being a Gothic church. This, this is a House of Parliament, which is, you know, they have... Just like the Capitol in Washington, you know, they have a House, uh, a House of Representatives and a Senate. They have a House of Commons and a House of Lords. But it's it's a government building uh, with government offices and, you know, all those things uh, that you need for government offices. And they don't need um, the light coming in the way you do for Gothic cathedrals or um, or any of the other ornamental aspects of Gothic. They're, it's not something they need. And... Uh, nor, nor do they need, the, need it to be neoclassical. Um, the, the neoclassical aspect is, has to do with the, the, the architect who was, um, uh, Charles Berry was the, was the architect of the main building, the structure of the building, and Pugin was the name of the architect for uh, the goth, Gothic ornament. Um, the reason, you know, the, the neoclassicism was, you know, part of the spirit of the age, of the uh, uh, the, the, as I explained last time, that you know, in the mid 1700s, the rediscovery of Pompeii and interest in uh, uh, classical things, and and so that was the reason for the way you make this. You know, they they picked a neoclassical architect for that reason, uh, because that was the way things were being made, but also because of that, the romance, I guess, of of. You know, romantic age. But one of one of its characteristic, the sort of emotional characteristic, was a, a nostalgia for past ages. You know, glorification of things in the past. So that glorification of of the Gothic is is a reason why it has Gothic uh, skin on the outside. Okay, so so that's one kind of architecture in the eighteen hundreds is the revival of of a, of, a, of a past style. And they did other revivals of other past styles as, as well uh, because of that romanticism aspect. But in addition, there was also the Industrial Revolution going on and there was um, uh, new technologies coming around uh, for, for engineering. They, uh, uh, in the 1800s, they began uh, uh, having the, the, the ability to, to span greater distances, say for bridges, for example. And, and buildings to, to reinforce them with, with, with steel. And uh, this kind of architecture with uh, steel girders uh, has the, a benefit over the old kind of architecture using stone and wood in that you can span greater distances. You can make um, uh, much larger buildings than you could, or larger structures than you could uh, just with steel. And, I mean, just with stone and, and, uh, and wood. You can imagine you know, making a bridge, for example, and it's, it has to span a certain distance. If you use stone, you run up against the limit of how much stone, the strength of stone can can withstand in terms of its, you know, the span and how much weight is on the stone. It, at some point, it, it you, you run into a limit, and yet there are places where you need to span greater distances. How you do that? Well, with steel, steel has a much greater tensile strength than, than, uh, than stone or, or wood. And uh, uh, you, you, you can use it much more efficiently. That is, a much smaller amount of material is required to, 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 uh, to do the job, whatever the engineering task is. So 
in the 1890s. Um, this had become a, a, a staple for engineering to have lots of bridges made with this new uh, uh, new material. And uh, for the uh, World's Fair, it was going to be in 1889 in Paris. World's Fairs are, are, are big commercial enterprises. They, they make a big show uh, where you know, they, they draw lots of people in to see the new technologies and new um, things, uh, new things that are being that are for sale. Uh, lots of merchandise and uh, lots of uh, opportunities for new manufacturers, new products, and and uh, new engineering marvels uh, for people to come see. And the symbol of this fair uh, was chosen to be this this. Uh, uh, Eiffel Tower. You, I'm sure you're really familiar with it. This is the symbol of France. Well, in 1889, this was a this was a very new thing, and uh, it was a, a bold decision to do this. I mean, this is a, a very big building. It's a uh, it's over a thousand feet tall, and at the time, the 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 tallest stru man-made structure was, I think, the Washington Monument, which I don't know how tall it is. It, it, it's it's Probably not more than half this this height. So, making something this tall was uh, um, was a, was you know moving beyond the the, the limits of the time. And uh, it was originally meant to be a, a temporary thing. It was just made for the for this World's Fair. I think it was maybe they were gonna they had planned to tear it down after the fair or maybe after maybe twenty years or something. Uh, but uh, people liked it. It was made. It was really made to last. And it, and and it's. Uh, uh, and it's still there. It's um, comprised of lots and lots of steel girders. You can see them in there. This becomes the structure. And you notice that you can see through it. It's uh, uh, it doesn't have any skin on it. It's the the structure itself is what you see. Just a little bit of ornament here, uh, but mostly it's just it's all structure. And the structure is so efficient that is steel. Uh, girders are so efficient that it doesn't take nearly as much material. If you imagine, if you tried to make this out of stone, um, it would take a lot of stone uh, to hold all of this up. Um, but if the way this is, this is like the base is a square, and it's um, it's a square there. Uh, it's about 400 feet long on a side of a square. And if you were to take all of this metal and melt it down. And pour it into the square, it would only go up about two and a half inches. Also, if you were to make a box, say 400 feet wide and uh, as tall as the Eiffel Tower, the space occupied that by that box, the air inside that space, would weigh almost as much as the tower itself, made of steel, because there's so <laughs> there's so little. Uh, material in relationship to its size. That's what I'm talking about. And it's also it's a grandly beautiful thing. I mean, look look at uh, you know the, the the just the look of it. This this angles uh, this this here the picture of it being built. Um, it's just a, it's just a beautiful spire, and it's entirely designed. Just almost entirely. Almost everything in, about it is for structure, and and when when engineers make something where the it, the structure is the most important, and the and the, the forces of nature, gravity, and the strength of the materials are all the things that determine what you how you make a thing. Then then it, the result is often a thing of beauty, because uh, the elegance of the shape. You know, in order to get a thing this tall, with the least amount of material, um, you know, you have to have a certain amount at the bottom of base. You know, with a, that, with a certain amount of strength that will hold all of this, and then this has to hold all of this, and then this has to hold all all of this, and it gets progressively smaller as you go up. Uh, all all the, all this thing creates a, you know, a dynamic upward movement that's that's very very appealing. And of course, for our purposes and studying the you know the history of architecture, this was is very significant. In, in fact, in the in the sense that this technology is what's going to become the uh, um, 
you know, what makes skyscrapers, and we'll see skyscrapers later and see how they evolved. Okay, so getting back to painting. In, uh, in the 1840s uh, uh, or so, the, the, uh, the, the, this uh, neoclassicism and romanticism were still in, in force, and they were both, you know, kind of establishment things. You know, the, the Salon of Paris was the arbiter of what art was, and the people who, uh, who you know, the institutional people, the elites, were the ones who would decide what, what was and what was not art, and their idea of art was very highbrow. I mean, it all had to be, um, you know, from the classical tradition, it had to be, uh, you know, figures had to be idealized and drapery and surfaces and all the, everything had to be smoothed out and, and perfected uh, to be accepted into that world. Well, there were a number of people who rejected that and the number of people rejecting that, that authority of the Paris Salon increased over the course of the century. But it began with this, uh, this artist named uh, Gustave Courbet. There's his name down there. Um, he was a classically trained artist who, you know, who could have painted things in that in that vein that would be accepted by the salon. But he was uh, um, kind of a troublemaker, I guess you could say. He he rejected it and and would would do things that would be kind of in the vein of of what the salon wanted: big historical looking. Uh, paintings with uh, heroic looking figures, except that the subjects of his pictures were not heroic themes. They were not biblical stories. They were not mythological stories. In fact, he um, uh, limited his subject matter to things that were real, that things he could see. Uh, he said, you know, he doesn't paint angels. He says, I, you know, un un unless I see one, I'm, I'm not going to paint it. So he paints things that he sees. But he was also uh, uh, kind of a, a politically sub subversive as well. He, he wanted to, uh, not just things, just anything that he saw, but things that he saw as being kind of a, you know, social injustice kind of things. And, and in this case, uh, as he told the story, is that he was walking down a road one day and he saw these two people uh, working on the side of the road. They're called uh, stone breakers. That is, people whose job it is to break stones with a hammer uh, in order to turn stones into gravel. And the gravel is used for construction, like in making roads and things. And there's an old man uh, down on one knee with a, with a big hammer with a long, uh, a long handle, and he's breaking stones. He's wearing old clothes that are patched and, and frayed, uh, and old and old-fashioned kind of shoes. I mean, like the like the wooden shoes. And then there's a young man next to him. Looks like almost he's a teenager uh, doing the same sort of job. He's hauling up a, a big basket filled with gravel. He's also wearing um, uh, tattered clothes, but they're more modern clothes rather than uh, clothes of a style from a previous generation. These are the modern clothes, but they're but they're all they're in tatters as well. And the implication here is that you know this boy uh, is going to you know he has no other prospects but to do this job, and that. He will eventually become this man when he grows up. He's, he has his whole life will be just as this man was, uh, manual labor uh, uh, for for his whole life, and he will you know live in poverty. So the artist has you know he 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 made a sketch of these people, and went back to his studio like a like a classical studio like a like a, uh, an academic studio, and he painted a, a big large what's like a history painting of this. And uh, uh, he, instead of polishing everything smooth and with color, and you know, to make it look, you know, like a like a like a Raphael or a, or or any of the other uh, neoclassical artists, he he deliberately gives it a, a, um, a an earthy tone, both in you know earth colors, but also sort of a rough texture to everything, like like the kind of texture of, of this man's pants. You know, everything seems to have, even the sky up here, have, has a texture to it. It was kind of rough and, and rustic looking. So it has a social message to it, in addition to being a real thing that he saw. 
Now, not only does the, the academy not, you know, they, 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 well, they, they frown on, on having things that are contemporary, the things that where the story being told is something that's happening just now, as we saw with, with uh, the raft of the Medusa. But also, uh, uh, just this look, everything about it looks as if he's trying to elevate um, base things, or what, what they would call vulgar or common things, up to the level of, of the kind of art that the, the, the Academy likes. And, and of course, the Academy didn't like that idea. So he, he spent his whole career sort of at odds with the world and, uh, and, and, and being against the establishment. And the establishment, you know, was, uh, was crumbling over the course of the, of the century. Uh, beginning essentially with the Romantics and the, and the people like uh, uh, Constable, and and then when you get to this this uh, to Courbet, who began a, a sort of a, a group around him of people of like-minded sort of people who are called the realists, not realists in terms of their style, but realists in terms of their subject matter. Uh, these are, are uh, because of the effect of these people, the, the establishment is going to start crumbling. And then they will crumble more and more until it's pretty much out of the out of the picture by the end of the century. Another realist is named uh, Jean Francois Millet, or Millet, or Millet. Uh, he is a <coughs> he is an artist who uh, you know, like Courbet, he would go out and paint these sort of socially informative pictures. Um, this one's called the Gleaners. Uh, you see three women who were out in the field uh, picking up uh, straw, like a, a, a grain of some kind, like wheat or barley. And they're, uh, um, they're in the foreground. And they are, this, is, this is a large picture, like a heroic picture, like, like the Stonebreakers. Only, um, you know, the, the, these, these figures are painted as if they're the heroes of the picture. And in the background, you see the establishment people, the people like the, the owners of this farm, there's a uh, there's like a foreman over here, and there's some laborers over here, very small in the background. You can hardly see them, and they are um, they're the one harvesting all the grain. They have a great big wagon here filled with grain, and you can see all of the the abundance, uh, you know, great big stacks of it over here. So you know there, there's plenty all over the place, and as an act of of charity, I guess you could say it, um, the the you know the owner has allowed some poor people to come. And pick up whatever's left after the harvesters have come, gotten all the, the main bits. Uh, they can come and, and pick up whatever they can. You can see that they have in their hands little, you know, bits of straw, bits of of, uh, of wheat. Say, you can see this one down here, you know, bending over and, and picking up what looks like you know individual grains that might have fallen onto the ground. And that's you can imagine that's backbreaking labor. And you can see the 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 way he's depicted them as, uh, you know, bent over like this, as if you have to go way down to get all of this stuff, just the, the meager leftovers. Um, and then this one who's standing is still stooped. In fact, look at the way he's got her top of her head right at the horizon line, as if, as if that's holding her down, as if she's not even going to be able to, to stand upright. Uh, you know, it's pushing, it's almost pushing her down. Um, you know, it, so so we feel for them. We feel like these. This, it's it. It doesn't seem just that, that all these people would have all this plenty, and then these people are left to to, to grovel for little little bits of of uh, of leftovers. So that aspect of the picture, that sort of social injustice that that is being uh, illuminated here, is is part of the realist um, theme. Uh, but really, the, 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 the umbrella term realism referring really is, is just about uh, an artist painting things that they see you know, rather than things that, that come from their imagination. When you think of academic artists painting pictures of angels or, or, or warriors or you know, Romans or Greeks or mythological gods, whatever, those come out of their imagination. And they're taught in an academy how to render things from their imagination to look like as if they were real. But they're actually imaginative things. Here, the artist is making things that are real that he's actually seen. And he does so you know, in, a, in, a, 
in a very attractive way. It's a very beautiful picture in terms of the tonality, uh, the volume of the figures, the, the, the re relationship between um, higher contrast areas that, you're, that are being emphasized here and the lower contrast areas back here so that you know, these things all fade into a background. The figures in the ground are, are, are related in terms of this, uh, this tonality and, the, and also this, you know, uh, the, 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 the saturation of everything is a low saturation so that it all um, is all in the same color family. But the contrast is what's, what's changing from one place to another. So to emphasize these as kind of heroic figures, whereas these are minor figures back here. And, uh, uh, you know, interesting compositional things going on as well as, as, the, as the message is being said. Well, also in the realist camp was this artist named uh, Corot. And uh, Corot, C-O-R-O-T. Uh, he was an artist, arts also classically trained, and, uh, and made, made pictures and attempted to put them in the... Uh, in the salon of, of Paris, as you know, competing with all the other others, you know, landscapes were were considered sort of lower down in the scale in terms of uh, of uh, the hierarchy of what's the most important pictures and the next higher, next higher. Landscapes, you know, were sort of in the middle. I think genre paintings are even even lower, or still lifes are even lower than that. But the but the uh, among landscapes in the academic tradition would be the kind of landscapes that you would see from uh, followers of Poussin. You know, back there where you have like that one with John on the island of, of, of uh, Patmos. You know, the, it's just a, a big artificial uh, landscape and has a little classical figure in it to sort of give it a, a legitimate story. And Corot did some of those. You know, he did some, some uh, classical looking landscapes that are they had uh, you know biblical stories or something going on, and and and, and some of them were rejected, were were accepted. Some were rejected by the salon. But the thing that was moving him in the direction away away from the uh, the academy, the salon, the establishment, was he he'd go out into the landscape with paint and paint exactly what he saw. That is, uh, plain what's called plain air uh, painting, where you uh, you paint it directly. Uh, on a surface, on, a, on while you're looking at it, so you're res responding similar to what uh, um, Constable was doing with those studies that I showed you. Um, and those studies, as you remember, or weren't weren't ever uh, weren't shown to the public. I mean, they were uh, they were his private things for studying for for getting to his compositions. But but even his compositions, like that uh, that Haywain. You know that was bought and brought and shown at the at the Paris Salon. The, the people in, in Paris were you know were amazed at at this English painter who was painting real landscapes where you could see the greenery and you could see the uh, lushness of nature. And that looking at nature, you know, and sort of longing for that kind of uh, idealized nature was a romantic thing. But here, what's making Corot a realist is there's nothing. Uh, sentimental about his pictures of, of landscapes. You know, he would go out there and it almost like a, a scientist um, um, reproducing what he sees. And they're, they're done, even though they, they look rather painterly and they look uh, natural in every way, you know, he would do some studies outside and then go into a, a studio and meticulously make these things look as though they were all spontaneous. Um, his 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 pictures are characterized by uh, by this feathery brushstroke, and he has this silvery green going on all the time. If you look at a whole bunch of corrodes, you see the same sort of palette. They're relatively low chroma. It's not it's not about a uh, lots of bright colors. I mean, you think of you know, later we'll see impressionists, and impressionists will you know they will have bright colors and completely you know unmixed colors right out of the tubes, just sticking uh, in and and very very large broken brush strokes, and that's, that'll be Impressionism. But those people would look back to Corot as their, as their example of, of uh, you know, the way you ought to do it. They just moved into a higher key of, uh, in terms of saturation in their paintings. But uh, and Corot is always low, low saturation. 
but his his directness is the thing that's making it a, a realist picture and is what was most appealing to the the, the next generation of uh, of artists who come up okay and another realist his name Edouard Manet uh, not to be confused with Monet, we'll see later, who's, who's an Impressionist. Manet is a realist. Uh, this is a picture uh, called The Luncheon on the Grass, which caused, <coughs> which caused quite a stir when it first came out. It's, um, um, and it was intended to. He was almost, you know, thumbing his nose at the Academy. You know, when he was painting this picture, he, he was like deliberately trying to get a rise out of him. What's going on? is that um, here's a painting of, uh, of, of two men and a woman, and, and two women in, in, a, in, a, in a landscape. The women are, 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 are nude, or almost nude for the one in the background, and the, and the men are dressed. And they're dressed in modern-day Parisian outfits. And they're, they're apparently in the woods in, on a, in a picnic, and there's a you know, cloth on the ground with the picnic stuff. Uh, around and they're they seem to be engaged in conversation, kind of ignoring the women, and the this woman here is completely nude and looking out at us um, with this expression on her face, almost as as if she's sort of challenging us about this what's going on in the scene. Well, the story behind this, you know, it's kind of strange because because it it's odd uh, to see this happening, but. Um, there's there's precedence for, for all of this. Uh, um, if you look at um, here's an engraving by uh, is a, is an engraving made uh, from a drawing by by Raphael, and uh, so Raphael would be somebody who is the you know the the top of the uh, of the top echelon of, of the people that the that the Academy would admire, and this is a, a is an image of what's called river gods. You know, it's a it's a mythological scene with two men sitting, and there's a woman sitting here, and it's almost almost identical poses. This pose of this woman, this man, uh, and especially the, re the relationship of these three figures is almost identical to to this group. And so he's 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 deliberately. Uh, lifting a, a composition from a Raphael to get this group, and also the idea of, of clothed men, uh, you know, being in a scene with with nude women. Uh, well, this is something by Titian, another artist who would be admired by the Academy, and this is uh, called the Pastoral Concert. Uh, is a an image that's as uh, you know in the in the Mannerist period. I mean, there was. It was popular in Venice to have pictures like this, where there's, you know, they're sort of evoking um, pastoral poetry, and the and the and the men here are like playing music, and these women represent muses, uh, so it's an allegorical kind of picture. So within the, this context, you know, two nude women and two clothed men makes sense in terms of the mythology of what's going on, and and of course, you know, this this pose, these the nudity of these figures. Is explaining that this is a mythological story, but the thing about nudity is that context matters, <laughs> and and uh, uh, within this context, a nude woman with a bunch of clothed men in in the woods gives the impression that this is this is not a mythological story. This is not a, a historical picture. This is like you know two guys with 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 prostitutes out in the woods. In which case, that would be a scandalous thing. Um, and when you think of the kind of scandal that would come from this, and you, and you think, well, at the same time this was uh, submitted to the Salon for evaluation, um, this was also submitted, and this was accepted, and this was highly praised. This, this would be an academic picture, something that the academic people would think is this, this is the highest you can get. I think the emperor bought, bought this one because it was you know, the best thing there. Um, even though it has a great deal more realism the, and finish to than the Manet, it's and it has a, a, a nude woman, but but it's uh, it's the context. This is the birth of Venus, so it's a mythological story, and it's obviously very artificial, with you know flying babies around there. So we're because of the context, the world that this is in, 
is in is the kind of world that the that the academy admired, and so the nudity in it has nothing to do uh, with prostitutes or anything unsavory. It's it's just mythology, and everybody accepts that within that context, nudity is is entirely appropriate. But in this context, it's not, uh, and so this was scandalous. What happened was in the in the salon of of 1863. Um, this was not only rejected, but lots of, I think a third of, of all of the paintings that were uh, submitted for the Salon were rejected. And it was so many that there was a, a big protest by the people who were rejected. And those and the, the emperor, hearing about the protest, thought, you know, it would be a nice gesture to have another Salon. It's just for the people who, who were refused or rejected. It was called the uh, Salon of the refused ones or the rejected ones or the rejects. And, uh, and in that salon, it was hugely popular. A thousand people a day came to see it and, and you know, and paid to see all these, these pictures. And it, was, it wasn't just Man A. So it was all the big, you know, people who were going to become the big names of the, because uh, uh, this was sort of a, a kind of a tipping point where the, the power of the academy was going to start waning a lot because, uh, because of the increased popularity of the people who were, Against the academy, people were rejected by that, that uh, the elites, and who were bringing up this new, uh, new look, a new way of, 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 of representing the art with with, uh, uh, with subject matters that were real. And that's why they called the the first um, volley in the war, I guess, against the academy was were, were people who were called the realists. Later in his career. Uh, Manet painted this. It's called the a uh, uh, bar at the Folies Berger. The Folies Berger is a, a kind of a cabaret, a big entertainment venue in Paris. And uh, what we're looking here at here is the concession stand. There's a there's, there's a lady here who's who's confronting us right in the center of the picture. She's looking at us, and she's behind the bar. And there's a bunch of bottles of champagne and some beer. It's like bass ale here, and a bowl of Mandarin oranges and stuff. It's very pretty looking. Uh, marble top. And she's standing right in front of a, a mirror. And in the mirror you can see a bunch of stuff which we know from the context of the, of the title. Fully Spare Shade is like a big, like an opera house, you know, with lots of, of uh, balconies with loaded with people. And the people, as you, even though they're rendered in a, in a very sketchy manner, are you know, upper class people wearing uh, finery. It was a men in, in top hats and coats and uh, women in, in fancy dresses, but uh, they're rendered so sketchy in the background, you can almost, uh, you know, lose the resolution of everything. Uh, you realize, you know, these little blue brushstrokes are top hats with their uh, gleam on them and faces, and you know, lots of lots of men and women at this at this show. This is a, a big chandelier over here, and lots of lights. And you can see up here in the upper left corner is the feet of a trapeze artist. Because all of this is reflected in a mirror. So in front of her would be a great big open space, which is the, the show and a stage down there. And you know some sort of act, act is being performed and that for all these people to see. I think this woman is holding uh, opera glasses. There's another tier down there. So it must be a big venue going on. Uh, also in the mirror, you see her back. Of the woman here, and the person in front of her would be the person in our space confronting the one that she's looking at was a man in a top hat who's come apparently to get some uh, concessions here at the concession stand. Um, so uh, similar to the to the the stone breakers, this is, has a kind of a, a social meaning to it. Like it, what we're seeing is this this woman. In the context of all of these uh, elites partying over here, is is giving us an expression of what it's like to be a servant in this in this in the context of this world. Her face and expression on her face is so sad and forlorn, even though she's dressed very prettily and you know to to be made up to to attract customers. I'm sure with with you know lace and velvet and necklace and brooch and earrings and all, all this other stuff, all, all the finery that's surrounding her 
yet her expression is one of sadness. And that is, is, the, is the, I guess, the, the social commentary of what's going on here, and the fact that she's sort of uh, being confronted by, a, by, uh, by, by some rich guy, you know, and, and, and that she's, she has to be here, this is, this is her job, and that, uh, you know, we are to look at this and, and, and feel for her, feel sorry for her, being in this position, even though everything around her is gorgeous and beautiful, no, not just not just you know finery and beauty and 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 you know materials, marble and glass and light and and show and prettiness. Uh, it's also wonderfully painted. It's a beautiful, beautiful image. But we we see that face on her and that and that she's and she's sad. And so that's that's the the realist aspect of, of what's going on here. Um, later in it, at the time this was painted the 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 impressionists had already come with their broken brush strokes and it has that quality of of, similar, of of the impressionists but he never officially joined their group he was always in the camp of the, the realists um, one thing about that that kind of brush stroke that that you see having a broken brush stroke and having things not polished means if everything is like that then it's it is a way to unify the picture uh, so that it all becomes one fabric of texture. Wonderful thing. I mean, this this that device of having the mirror back there flattens out, <laughs> flattens out the picture, and all these geometric shapes, horizontals and and, and verticals around, you know, creates a, a gridded structure for the thing for all these organic shapes uh, to uh, to play against. Wonderful that that bright bright orange with all the rest of the the low chroma blues around there it was just, just singing right there so that's the bar of the book Folies Berger by, by Manet all right the, the last artist we have in the realist group is named uh, James McNeil Whistler he was an American though he spent all his, all his uh, his career in in Europe mostly England uh, and this is Whistler's mother uh, which is the official title is an arrangement in gray and black. Uh, he titled uh, his pictures not uh, not as uh, the content of the picture, but usually using terms that has to do with uh, uh, with music, like the kind of the kind of titles that music has. When you think of music, that music doesn't have uh, like classical music doesn't have, doesn't have content. It doesn't have imagery. It doesn't have a story. It's really just music. It's completely abstract, and so the names like nocturne and uh, arrangement and symphony, all these things, he would use these words uh, as titles of his pictures to indicate that his pictures are not about the content of the pictures. They're arrangements. They are um, they're designs. They're paint on a surface for the purpose of. Of, of composing this world that's that is the picture and uh, that attitude was at odds with the Academy as well because um, one of the aspects of the Academy that that uh, this new group of people was were rebelling against the was that the that the, the Academy saw art as a as a kind of a so had a social function to it it was like a uh, a moral aspect of, of art that, that that it was it it had a certain meaning and a function within a society and that and that uh, you know the artist sort of owed it to society to make pictures that are like the kind of pictures that the academy wanted and to to break that to to do something different was 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 radical and uh, Whistler made it clear that you know his his pictures aren't like that. That his that a, an artist doesn't does know anything to anybody other than himself and to you know follow his own vision. And when you think of the you know the kind of things that he was saying, this art is for art's sake rather than for society's sake. Uh, when you think of, of, of that attitude, this is very modern. It's just, in fact it is the attitude essentially of the 20th century. And and so for him to be saying this in the in the 1800s is uh, he was very. Uh, progressive and forward-thinking in that sense. Uh, the work on your uh, of his that's on your list is called Nocturne, uh, uh, falling rocket. Rocket, I mean like a firework rocket. 
Um, this is a painting. Look, without without knowing the falling rocket aspect of it, um, you could easily mistake it for something from the 20th century. This is an entirely a uh, an abstract picture. In fact, it looks like American abstract expressionism from the 50s. It's it's uh, a bunch of dots on a dark background that's this sort of hazy and sort of what appears to be random colors everywhere. Um, some of them blotchy, some of them sharp, like as if he took uh, a brush and just sort of spattered paint around. It's a, uh, 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 it's a rather interesting composition in that sense as an abstract, and it's and it has a lot of life and energy. It kind of looks like an explosion. But what's going on in the picture is that um, there's a certain place at night that you go to, and there the, where they have fireworks displays. You know, some garden somewhere, and it's and it and it, there's water there, and things reflect in the in the light of the. Uh, uh, of the fireworks into the water, and there are people around who look at it, and 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 so when you start thinking about that, you say, oh, I can, okay, that's this must be the edge of the water, and this is, you know, a person. There's a few people here looking, and over here is must be the um, whatever the structure is that is being illuminated by by light from fireworks and stuff, and this is the fireworks falling. You know, that's what it looks like. I've seen fireworks, and you know, it looks like little dots of light out there. So it it is a realistic image of that what you would see at night if you saw a fireworks show. So um, that's that's what the Academy wants, a realistic image of something, you know, no, not, not, not as such, really. It's, 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 it's hardly real at all. And uh, as for the realist, he's painting something that he actually saw. It's a real subject. But he's painting it so far away, so far removed from um, what the Academy would think of as... as uh, um, as, as an acceptable sort of picture, that he, he, was, um, he, he was widely criticized, especially by John Ruskin, who's a, an art critic, um, who saw it in a, in a show and, and said that it was as if he were uh, throwing a bucket of paint in our face uh, and, and that, and that he, was, he was being sort of uppity, like, a, like a, uh, he being one of the elite uh, and artists being much beneath him, uh, that he's this, um, you know, someone being uppity and, and, and behaving above his station in that he's uh, presenting this as art and that in his idea, Ruskin's idea, that this was as far as you could be from art. It's like you've thrown a, a bucket of face, a, a paint in our face. So um, Whistler sued him and in the ensuing trial, uh, Whistler explained his position that his his art was, as I said, it's, it's paint on a surface and it's uh, uh, the artist doesn't know anybody, anything. He's he's just, he's just painting for himself, and that it's all about the design. It's all about making a painting. It's all those things that we think of as as the 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 twentieth century attitude towards art is is originating in uh, in Whistler's defense in his uh, in this trial. He won the trial, though the the jury only awarded him awarded him a farthing, which was you know, nothing. And so it, it the, the court case uh, bankrupted him. It took a long time to recoup, but uh, he did have a big following uh, during the time. And and he, uh, you know, the movement that included, you know, Whistler and Manet and Courbet and Corot, um, were all all those people got together and they're not got together yet together. But the the actions of these people moved. Uh, um, the notion of art, you know, a, away from the academic notion, and uh, what we're going to see in the next one is is how it, it moved even farther away until you know we get to the end of the century and the and the, uh, the academy is no longer a player.